Hey, I don't know what your home office looks like, but this is mine. I like working from home. It's quite, quite relaxing, don't you think? Hi, I'm Ken Hughes. I wanted to talk to you today about the captive economy, about the, the new way that we all live and work, the new social norm. I think it's fascinating. I mean, as a, as a behavioralist, it's a fascinating time to watch the fundamentals of economics, the fundamentals of society all shift. Because in that shift, there's a, there's a really exciting, I know it's a dangerous time, it's a worrying time, but for me, it's a really exciting time to watch how people are adapting in their natural environments, how, how those challenges that we're all being faced with every day are being dealt with by people, and what that means in, in my world for brands and for the businesses and the clients that I work with all over the world. So how can we how can we find new ways to connect with our consumer? I mean, that's always the challenge anyway, isn't it? No matter what the disruption, how do we connect with the consumer? How do we stay relevant? How do we grow our business? How do we bring products and services to market that people want? I mean, that's marketing 101. So now we're, look, we're, we're facing, in the captive economy, we're facing a new consumer. We're facing a consumer behind glass. We're, find, we're facing a consumer who has different needs and wants than ever before. We have new fears, we, we have uncertainty, we're worried, we're anxious, uh, we're trapped. We have had our freedoms taken away. Um, so this breeds a whole new set of values that if brands and businesses understand, they can really uh, resonate with the new consumer. They can uh, connect with them in, in new ways. They can communicate with them in, in, in proper ways. Because once you understand how values work, you can make sure your communications tap into those values. So let's have a look at some of those values. Uh, let's explore them and understand what's driving them, the psychology behind them. And perhaps then you can take those to your brand and business and apply them in a way that will bring you more business or even maybe just make the business survive the next three or four months. And it will be three or four months. I think people have made the mistake that they think that this is a short term, couple of weeks. And I think the novelty is worn off. I think most of us understand now, various countries, of course, are in various stages of lockdown, but I think most of us get it. Most of us get that it's here to stay. Uh, it's here to stay certainly for two or three months uh, and that the shifts in behavior that we're going to see may very well last much, much longer than that. So the game is on in terms of, as it always is in business, to understand what the consumer wants now and how we can reflect that in our brands and businesses. So let's have a look at those five values and see what we can understand. Okay, so let's look at that first value of the new captive economy consumer. I want to talk about freedom, freedom as a value. Uh, we've fought for freedom for centuries. Um, it's not only back in the 1800s when slavery finished, uh, we fought for political freedoms, for economic freedoms. So freedom is something that we value hugely in democracies. Uh, and as individuals, we feel it's our right to be able to choose, you know, to have the decisions um, that we can make, be they big or small, they're ours to make. Um, so you choose where to work, where to live and with whom. Uh, but then you choose small things like what to have in your sandwich, or will I have another drink at this bar, or will we change bars? Or so. We're used to making literally hundreds and thousands of decisions a day uh, about what we're going to do. Um, when you take that ability to make decisions away from us, we kind of feel quite aggrieved. So you're, you're getting into the psychology of captivity, where understanding how people in captivity, be it imprisonment, uh, or be it uh, in kidnapping situations, react. And basically there's an underlying anxiety, of course, when you take someone's freedoms away, when you deny them the ability to satisfy their own desires. Uh, that is a fundamental, we would view it as a human right, but actually from a human psychological point of view, it's just our nature to do what we want when we want. Um, so we've taken freedoms away from consumers now. Uh, they're not able to go where they want, they're not able to shop where they want, they're not able to do what they want. So underneath the anxiety about the virus itself, underneath the fear of the pandemic and the fear of, of illness and death, there's also another anxiety that is more psychological about the removal of freedoms. Uh, and what happens when you take freedoms away? Well, sometimes bad things happen. Um, and so there will be a negative reaction to this. So there's got to be a grieving process, as always, with anything. And so the bargaining and the anger that follows any grieving process is likely to be taken out on all sorts of, of random directions. So you can take it out on your partner or the person you're living with in the home. You can take it out on your employer. Uh, and some consumers will take it out on brands. So those phone calls that will go through to call centers, maybe utility call center or broadband call center, banks, um, you're gonna find the consumer at the other end being a little bit more on edge. You're gonna find quite an angry consumer. Uh, they're angry about so many things, but part of it is that freedom that's been taken away from them. And so now from a customer experience point of view is the time that brands really need to bring it. They need to bring a level of customer experience that they maybe have never ever thought of before. A heartwarming, authentic, connecting uh, customer experience that lets the consumer know that 
the brand and the business is there for them. So I think the freedom and the, ta the taking away of an individual's freedom and a consumer's freedom to choose, a freedom to buy, a freedom to go, uh, is, is a big one. And psychologically, I think people are going to struggle with that once this novelty phase is over. So I think anything you can do as a brand and a business to allow your consumer a bit of room, a bit of freedom within their contract, a bit of freedom within the how they buy or the subscription they already have, a freedom in terms of how they pay, a uh, freedom in terms of um, you know banks all giving us extended loan periods for mortgages and car loans. And so that's the kind of freedom that we need to reflect back to the consumer because freedom is something that they're struggling with right now in terms of coming to grips with this new captive economy. So what is the second value of the captive consumer? in this new captive economy we all find ourselves in. It's autonomy, that need for control. It's a fundamental human need. The best way to describe it, I think, is to think of the last time you jump scared someone. Think of the last time you stood in a dark uh, door or at the end of the stairs or behind someone's door in their bedroom uh, and you jumped out at them to give them that scare. I do it all the time to my kids. I'm a bad father. Um, that's what therapy is for anyway. You'll be fine, it'll all work out. Um, so that fight or flight response is really interesting, the fight, flight or freeze, it's, it's the body's immediate taking of control. So when you think about it, you jump out and the person immediately either screams and flails their hands. Um, it's a bit like the moral reflex uh, for a baby. Um, and that's basically designed to either scare the attacker away, the flailing and the screaming, or else to seek help from the tribe around you. Um, so you know, people hear you scream, they hear you, see you move and they come. Or even if you freeze in fright, it's also taking control because what you're trying to say is hopefully the, the attacker will think I'm dead and they'll move away. So it's an, it's an innate need in us to take control in a fear or risk situation. Um, and I think that's where we are here. It's a very uncertain time. Um, and I think we're all scared, understandably. And in that fear comes the need for control. We need to try and take some control ourselves. Uh, and that's a really strong value at the moment for everybody. It's one of the reasons that the panic buying trends we're seeing across the world, particularly evident strongly in the UK. Um, so I think people, when they're faced with no control, will try and control something at least, try and be somewhat competent in their own, in their own lives. And we see that hunter-gatherer uh, mentality kick in really fast and they go out into supermarkets and they, they gather as much food as they can and that way they feel like they're in control of some sort. Um, so what you're going to see in, in our own homes now is us needing to take control. So we'll take control in our family, in our homes, uh, we'll try and control our environments, we'll try and control as many aspects of our lives as possible to try and make ourselves feel a little bit better, to feel in control. And so what, what does that mean for us as business owners? What it means is that we need to be able to try and give our consumers control. And um, so if they want to change the way they do business with us, if they want to maybe readjust how they're paying their loan uh, to the bank, uh, we need to be able to give them full control. The worst thing we could do now, right now, is have any kind of terms and conditions that we think we want to imply, uh, you know, kind of push on to the consumer. Um, they're struggling in terms of control, so we need to help them control some aspect of their lives. So any brand or business that helps them with some kind of control, they will win, you know, and they will they will win well. And um, so it's a case of understanding uh, what you can do. I mean, the DIY stores. Uh, people are controlling their environment. So they, they, one of the things they first turn to is their environment. Well, let me control my environment. I'll control, uh, you know, uh, how my house looks and I'll paint it. Um, and I'll, I'll do some gardening. I'll... So the DIY stores were instantly really, really busy as people were locked in home. And of course, yes, they had their list of tasks that they needed to do anyway, maybe. But the, the need to take some control, to nest, to feel safe and secure in your environment. These are very, very strong values. So any brand that can help the consumer with autonomy and with control of their current life, be it financial control, mental health control, uh, environmental control, any control at all, will really, will really help. It's a strong value, autonomy. Okay, so what is the third value of the captive consumer, the consumer in this new captive economy that we all find ourselves in? Um, one thing I'm really fascinated by, and this is kind of a mental health aspect to all this situation, is the isolation and boredom and loneliness. Even if you live with people, by the way, this still is going to affect you. Um, of, of being in captivity. So if you look at the psychology of captivity again, look at something like the Stockholm Syndrome. I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with Stockholm Syndrome where, where the captor is so lonely and so anxious that they have positive attachment towards their kidnappers. They end up being empathetic to the person that actually is causing them harm. And that is because we have a equality called active attachment. When, when we're worried, when we're scared, we naturally attach ourselves to someone who may be able to help us. So in childhood, that would be your parent. You would attach yourself to your parent because they will protect you, they will help you in a scary situation. 
When we go into adulthood, we then look to our family and friends to help us in, in situations, or maybe your, your colleagues in work. Or, so we will automatically attach ourselves when we feel we're in fear or are at risk. What does that mean in the current situation is that, yes, we are at fear, we're, we're at risk, we're, we're scared, uh, and therefore, when we're isolated and we're lonely and we're bored, we're going to act out on those boredoms. So sometimes when people get bored, uh, I mean, there was a very famous quote that said, you know, you don't need a psychologist, you just need to go shopping. Shopping is cheaper than a psych psych psychiatrist. Um, I think people will turn to shopping out of boredom. But then there's a weird, ironic twist here that you can't obviously go out to physical stores, but you can use e-commerce. But then a lot of the e-commerce distribution and warehouse centers are closing um, because they can't be staffed either. So how will people buy if they can't buy? When they get bored, what will they do? There's a couple of scary watchouts here. I mean, if you're lonely and isolated and bored at home, and let's say you've been using some gambling websites in the past and you might have a slight addiction problem, we can all see that's the kind of retail therapy that we don't want. So people will end up spending a lot of time and money on digital devices, gambling, and that could lead to a very, very dark place. Um, I think so the mental health issues here to do with isolation are, are quite worrying. Uh, I think some brands have got it right and some brands have got it wrong in terms of trying to connect with the consumer in this new kind of isolated world. Uh, I think Next, the clothing company in the UK, moved quite fast when their physical stores were being shut down. They moved everything onto online, big 75% off sale. They got a lot of, lot of negative feedback immediately on social media. They were seen as preying on the pandemic, you know, feeding on people's boredom at home. Um, and within days, their physical warehouses and distribution centers were actually closed anyway, bringing the shutters down on their online offering um, because they had COVID cases in their warehouses and people felt it was unfair asking workers to go to those centers. And so that was that was an interesting play out in a couple of days. And then you've got other brands like, uh, you know, the biggest adult entertainment brand in the world, Pornhub.com, have rebranded themselves to being called stayathome.com and they gave free premium access to their website to everybody in the world for the next month. Uh, and so they're having some fun with it, you could say. Uh, they're using the fact that people are at home and maybe using their, their product. Uh, and so they're, they're using that as, as a fun way to communicate. So I think there are ways for you to connect with the consumer who is isolated and bored and lonely. Uh, and there's ways of building positive links. There's a restaurant near me locally. Obviously, it's no longer open as a restaurant. It's just a takeaway now. But they have a big sign in the window I saw yesterday that says healthcare workers take out for free. Now, obviously, it's, it's quite close to a hospital, so they will have a huge amount of traffic from those healthcare workers. It's a relatively new restaurant. It's only there six months. Um, and I, I'm going to guess that, you know, when all this pandemic is over, those healthcare workers that will have been taken care of by that restaurant uh, over the next few months, they will have their business for life. Uh, and in fact, even I, who am not a healthcare worker, have seen that sign. And now I know when that restaurant reopens, I'll certainly be going there uh, to support them as they supported the healthcare workers through this. So there are ways for us to connect with our consumer in the isolation, in the loneliness. Uh, and it's really important that we do that, but that we do that in a positive way and not in a kind of a corporate social responsibility tick the box way. Um, so get into that element of well, what can we do to alleviate the boredom, the loneliness and the isolation as a brand and as a business, what can we do? Uh, to lean into this and to build some positive traction with our consumers. Okay, number four, the fourth value of the captive economy. Uh, this is about community, uh, and this is probably one of the strongest values that you can really resonate today to link in with the consumer. Uh, if you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, do you remember that, the, the, little, the little pyramid that you might have studied in MBA or psychology, if you ever uh, did a course on, on psychology? So Maslow, was a, his theory was of motivation. And the basic of, basis of the theory was that as humans, we satisfy our base needs first. And once those needs are satisfied, we then move up the pyramid towards higher needs. So the bottom level was very physiological needs, a need for food, thirst, uh, shelter. The second level was safety, and that was to do with shelter also, but to do with social safety. Uh, and then you've got the, and safety today would mean many things, it would mean financial safety, employment safety, health safety, those kind of things. Uh, then the third level was, was uh, love and connection. It was about belonging. Then you've got esteem needs, and at the very, very top, you've got self-actualization in terms of uh, you know creativity and that kind of stuff. So the idea here is, if you washed up on a on a beach shipwrecked, you wouldn't instantly spend three or four days meditating and drawing sand art in in the in the sand, which would be kind of self-actualization. The first thing you would do would be try and find water, try and find food, try and find shelter. Once you'd satisfied those needs, then you might go up to safety. You then get to love and belonging, and, and so you, you work your way up. 
So I think where we are right now, if you strip it all right back immediately in the initial fear, that's why you do see the panic buying again, that at the very bottom lead need there, you know, I want and keep my family safe, I want to get food. And so that's why we saw a lot of that panic buying going on. At this stage, I think people are mostly happy that yes, food will be available and I am safe and secure in my own home. There are no kind of social unrest um, issues, certainly not globally, that the army and police are trying to fight. So at the moment, we're all doing what we were asked. We're all under house arrest, that's fine. And so if you work your way up the needs, what you get to is that, that third need very quickly, everything else is satisfied, is love and belonging and connection. And so because our freedoms have been taken away and we can't move socially, we can't see our friends and family, uh, that is a need that is going to be opening up hugely in our, in our bodies and hearts and souls. So we need to connect. We need to feel that we belong somewhere. Uh, and so at the moment, what we're seeing is um, a need to belong. Of course, you might be in a home with your family, and that's your individual unit of belonging. But in modern society, we've already have many different types of belonging. We belong in our office and our with our colleagues. We belong in our, in our gyms. We belong socially on, on digital. And so we have many, many ways of satisfying our social belonging. But many of us now have, have had to had those challenged in the last few few weeks. So the question is, how do you capitalize on this as a brand? Uh, it's, this is about community. And so it's everything from, you know, you'll see, you'll, you've seen it on your social media feeds, the, the balconies in Italy and everyone's playing the balconies. And so we're seeing a huge coming together of communities all over the world, uh, people pulling together. And for every individual story of selfishness or greed, so you see the people being shamed on Facebook for buying, buying loads of toilet roll, people are taking their pictures and sending it on Facebook, oh, do you know this person, shame them. And for every one of those stories, there are 10 or 12 stories of, of the beauty of humanity and people helping each other and kindness. Uh, and so I think... If a brand wants to tap in now, it needs to tap in through community, uh, but through heartfelt, authentic community. Again, not just the tick the box stuff. Um, so lots of things going on around the world. In fact, in Ireland here, the Jemison Distillery, uh, makers of fine whiskey, Irish distillers, changed their production plant from making whiskey to making alcohol gel. Uh, well before it kind of became the norm, maybe for large corporates to fund and to help the government. They did it well in advance of that. And that instantly, of course, is a really great story here in Ireland. People love Jemison here, obviously, for many reasons. <laughs> um, but, you know, the idea that they shut the factory down and making whiskey, changed over to alcohol gel, that really shows uh, as a brand, you get it, you're helping, uh, you're helping not in a profit way, but you're helping in a genuine way. So I think any brand or business needs to challenge itself right now to think, what can I do, uh, whether your brand is, whether your business is open or not, what can I do to really leverage community? How can I get involved? How can I help as a brand or business? Because the emotional ties that you will form between your brand and your consumer right now will probably be much stronger than you could ever have imagined or ever have achieved with a kind of a transactional bond in the past. So it's worth sitting down with a white page and a pen and asking yourself, how can I leverage community? How can I leverage this need for people to love, to belong, to feel part of something? If you can bring that to them, via your brand or business, or see and show that your brand or business gets this and is part of the solution and wants to be part of their community, then I think you, you've been a consumer for a long, long time. And the fifth value for consumers of the captive economy. To me, it's about digital, digital connection. And while, of course, digital has been here for the last 10, 15 years, it's been growing steadily, and every now and then we have a step jump in, in digital. Um, so usually a technology-driven step jump. So if you go back, you know, 20 years you had the PC on every desk and, and that, that, that step jumped email communication and then you had the laptop and that step jumped entertainment and then you had social media which step jumped connection and then you had the smartphone and Wi-Fi which step, step jumped the whole digital world that we know today. Every time there's a step jump our expectations as consumers kind of change. So if you want a really simple example take the rideshare apps that we all use the Ubers, the Lyfts, uh, anyone who hits a rideshare app you know, how, how long will you wait for a car? If you see three, four minutes on your screen, you think, okay, that's acceptable. If you see eight, nine minutes, you think, oh, no. Um, so our expectations have shifted hugely uh, by using digital. And what that means in the real world is that if you see a queue in the real world, you kind of have the same reaction to that eight, nine minutes. They call it a queue? No, no. So we, we want everything instantly. And so digital has been growing very, very slowly. But what we're seeing now in this new digital world, so we kind of are all leaning over to digital more than physical because the physical world has been taken away from us. What we're seeing is, is generations of consumers using digital more frequently for more things than they ever did before. And we're even bringing, of course, new consumers into digital. So for instance, my mother, my mother is 76 and she did her first online shop last week and had it delivered today. And um, now, will she 
do online shopping forever from now on? No, she still likes the store. But having done it once, I can see her from now on maybe doing a monthly shop for all the bulk items. Another friend of mine, her 71-year-old mother, uh, recently used Zoom a few days ago to teach six of her friends how to crochet. Now, so think about this. That that's a 71-year-old digital granny doing a webinar to her friends on crochet. And uh, she never thought she was a digital tutor, but there she is, you know, running a small digital uh, teaching course. So I think what's happening is this, this behaviors that we're going to interact with digital, all these house party and WhatsApp face social calls, and those things are going to bed down with huge amounts of people, even working from home, uh, you know, which, which was uh, maybe done by some people, but not by all people is now seen as, oh, you know, this does work. And so I think we're going to see huge digital, digital shifts in terms of how we live our lives, how we buy, how we work afterwards because of this pandemic. And I think they're going to last a lot longer. We're going to see new technologies that have been there for a long time, but more adapted during this crisis. So things like augmented reality, virtual reality. So you can go now to the Guggenheim Museum in, in New York if you want via Google Street View and walk around their museum and have a look at all the art. And so I think people will start to travel in the next few weeks via AR and VR, uh, via their laptops and their digital TVs and, and start to think, oh yeah, well, we can explore the world this way. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of digital content I mean, this being one, I'm talking to you now in a video. Um, so how much videos are we going to consume? I think there's a, there's, a, there's a, you know, if you want to talk about flattening the curve of the pandemic, I think there's, there's, a, there's a curve for digital. There's a huge amount of webinar and videos and Instagram lives being all pushed out at the moment. And the question is, do you really want to consume them all? Um, so there's going to be a jaded consumer of digital. What that means for any brand or business, you've got to produce content that is so creative that it will cut through the noise. There's so much digital noise now. You thought it was bad before. Now there is, I mean, every family are making funny memes and songs and pushing them out on social media. So if the average family is pushing out content, and they never were before, how, as a brand or business, do you try and push into that? Because there's so much stuff going on out there. People are jaded already of the corona memes. And so how do you produce your digital content in a way that will cut through all the noise? And that is a real challenge. Also, for any brand or business, you now have to look at digital as a channel. Obviously, we've been talking about that for 15 years, making sure you have digital products and digital channel. But now I think it's become a reality for even small business who have realized, wow, you know, I can't uh, make money out of my physical store. What do I do now? So I think it will be a great wake up call for digital. It will be a catalyst for digital. Not that we needed one, but we were certainly to be another. It will be the biggest non-technical step jump digital has seen because most of digital step jumps have come through technology. This would be the biggest social non-technical step jump in terms of how we behave as consumers, how we pull digital product through uh, because it's now the way we want to live our lives. And that won't change after this pandemic. So it's probably one of the most exciting things for digital disruption. And none of us saw it coming, of course. If you ask about disruption, people always assume it's going to be technical. And this is the, one of the biggest social, anthropological and behavioral disruptions that we may ever see in terms of how people consume digital. So it's exciting times, but as a brand or business, you really have to ensure that you now lead with digital in the current climate. Thank <music> you.